The IBRT's Threadless Store is now open. T-shirts, hoodies, even phone cases and protective face masks are now available at our very own merch outlet, iceboxradio.threadless.com. Choose from the IBRT logos, Scoop Sisters, Funny in a Small Town, Frozen Frights, and more. Then choose your merch. Clothing for men, women, and kids in a variety of colors. Accessories including buttons, stickers, mugs, and tote bags. Even notebooks and skateboards are available, and every sale helps the Icebox Radio Theater continue to bring the Northland's stories to the world. That's the Icebox Radio Merch Store at iceboxradio.threadless.com or just visit iceboxradio.org. Frozen New Audio's Theater of Suspense and Terror, now on Icebox Radio. <laughs> Good evening. This is the Winter Warlock. And you're listening to the Frozen Frights podcast here on the Icebox Radio Theater. Tonight, on this Halloween, we offer up to you three original ghost stories. Recorded before a live audience, at least they were live at the beginning, at the Salty Jester in International Falls, Minnesota. Never heard before by an audience of living people. Here now is our special gift to you for this 31st of October. Three ghost stories from the Icebox Radio Theater. The Docks We Pass Daryl became a very cautious boater the day he nearly ran his outboard up on a reef. It was the fall of the year and fog clung to the surface of the lake. He was traveling from a friend's cabin to his own just before dawn. The two of them had spent all night playing cards and drinking, and Daryl had had a fine time. Maybe too fine a time, as he got a little sloppy at the tiller that morning. The rapids seemed to jump up at him, and he had to turn hard to avoid them. Many a fisherman had fallen prey to that field of white foam, filled with hidden rocks of sharp granite. Some suffered damaged hulls. A few even took an unscheduled swim. There was even a story of a fellow dying there. Thrown from his boat, he was. Landed head first on a stone sharp as an axe. They even say his head was separated from his body. But Daryl didn't believe that part of the story. Daryl was a practical man. Back in possession of himself and his boat, he chuckled to himself as he slid peacefully away from the reef and rapids and putt-putted towards home. He felt pleasant, still slightly drunk from the night's revelry, and now past the rapids, he felt very safe indeed. Safe, that is, until he approached the cabin with the lady. It was an old cabin, older than most. The dock was splintered and full of holes. The cabin itself was badly in need of repair. One window was covered with plywood that had itself weathered to gray with age. The other window had a cracked corner repaired with duct tape and was filthy besides. And it was in that filthy window that the lady always appeared. She was tall and thin, her hair as white as snow. The window's filth hit her features, but Daryl had the idea that her expression was sad. Maybe it was her posture, slouched, curved backed, and head hanging low. Whatever it was, she was always in the window and always gave Daryl the creeps when he motored by. There was something unnatural about the woman, supernatural even. Daryl had lived on this lake his whole life, but he never knew anyone to live in that old cabin. Even as a boy running through the woods with his pals, causing a ruckus, chucking pine cones at girls they liked, Daryl always knew how to stay away from the nameless cabin, with the one window missing, 
and the other window cracked. He didn't know what it was different about this time. Maybe it was the pre-dawn gloom. Maybe it was all the liquid courage he'd consumed. But he resolved for the first time to slow his crawl at the cabin and give the lady in the window a good, solid look. Maybe he'd even tie up and step onto its dilapidated dock. Maybe he'd talk to the woman, ask why she stared at him whenever he went by. And maybe, just maybe, he'd get an answer to why her staring unsettled him so. He rounded the lake shore and cut the engine as the cabin came into view. He brought his boat around and slid carefully up to the dock, stopping the boat's progress with his boot against a piling. He looked up. There she was. He looped a line over the piling and stepped up onto the dock, never taking his eyes from the figure in the window. He walked to the end of the dock and stepped up onto the shore. There were a few mud and brick steps up to the house, and he took them slowly, never altering his gaze from her. Then, just as he stepped up on the porch, no more than five feet from the window, the lady disappeared. Daryl froze. The pins and needles on his neck went into overdrive. He wondered if he should leave, or if he should knock on the door. Then, quite suddenly, the door before him opened with an almost human shriek. The face of a young girl appeared in the doorway. She was a miniature version of the lady he'd been seeing. Only ten, she was, maybe less, but she had the same white hair and the thin silhouette of a waif. And without filthy glass in the way, Daryl could see her eyes, large and black and almond-shaped. They filled Daryl with unease at first gaze. The girl stepped out and closed the door behind her. Hello, she said. Daryl found his voice gone, but managed to nod a reply. We're sorry. We didn't know, the girl said. Then she just raised her arm in her hand. Daryl saw a burlap bag that looked very, very old. Here! she said. What's this? Daryl asked. It's what we took without knowing, she said. We're sorry. Daryl stared at the bag. It looked like it had been buried for years. Without really thinking, he reached out and took it. Thank you, he said. We didn't mean to, really, the girl said. We found it under the house. When Ma and I moved in, they told us this place was haunted, but we didn't believe. Then we found that there and guessed again. Haunted. Yes, sir. This here place is haunted. That's how we got it so cheap. They told us a fella lost his head in the rapids up the stream a piece. And every morning, just before dawn, he comes by in his boat looking at it. Mama's been at the window trying to work up the nerve to bring it out here, and she pointed at the bundle. But finally today, she gave up and asked me to do it. Mama says I don't scare worth a darn on account of being born under a new moon. Daryl could have chuckled at that, but he was transfixed by the rough burlap bundle in his hands. He turned it over and over. There was something hard inside and not quite round. Please, mister, please don't do it no more. Mama's on her last nerve. Don't do what? Daryl asked. Don't come by here every morning. We don't give it back, so stop now, please. Every morning? I I don't come by here every morning. The girl looked at him. Her eyes, though black, seemed to be the only thing that gave off any warmth. She opened the door without taking her eyes from him and backed over the threshold. Just before she disappeared, she gazed up at him earnestly and said, Please? and then she was gone. The lock clicked in her absence. Daryl was confused. He he felt heat rising on his neck and a kind of buzzing in his ears. He moved the bundle and thought he felt the rough scratch of burlap against his cheek. He found the sack opening, reached inside and took out a human head. He looked at its face. His own eyes 
gazed back at him. Caleb Silvers, ladies and gentlemen. Nervous Traveler. Cheryl was a nervous traveler. She always had been. She carried a complete set of roadmaps for Minnesota, plus the four states around it, as well as two GPS systems. The trunk of her basic late model sedan, which rated top in its class for safety, contained not one, but four real spare tires. Cheryl couldn't tell you when this mania for safe travel began, and if she were honest, she'd admit there was no real reason for it. She was just plagued with the uneasy feeling that there was something bad was going to happen to her, and it would happen on the road. Winter was the worst. Winters in northern Minnesota could be unpredictable. Weather could go bad unexpectedly. Reporting on road conditions could be spotty. Snow, ice, wind, blowing snow. All of these things could descend with little or no warning. Cheryl preferred to avoid it all. And yet she found herself in her car late on a Tuesday evening, driving south on Highway 53 to visit her sister and cook. She was nervous, distracted. If she hadn't been so nervous, she might have noticed several odd things about this trip. The moon seemed to disappear and then reappear, despite the heavy cloud cover. Fog swirled along the roadway, despite the fact that it was bitter cold and had been for some time. But strangest of all was the lack of cars. Cheryl had driven for nearly an hour without seeing a single other vehicle. Admittedly, it was late on a winter Tuesday, but she should have seen something. There should have been headlights approaching her or in her rearview mirror. She noticed none of this. Instead, she gripped the wheel and stared unblinking at the ribbon of asphalt in front of her, trying to stay alert, sure the danger would come leaping out of the woods at any moment. But she did not see anything strange until the roadblock. It appeared at a distance of about a hundred yards as Cheryl rounded a corner and entered a long straightaway. She had plenty of time to slow down and take it all in. There were orange and white barricades, flashing amber lights, and a large detour sign pointing her onto a rugged gravel road off to the right. Strangely, there were no people, no cops or highway workers. And stranger still, the, the roadblock went right across the entire highway, blocking traffic both ways. It seemed she had little choice but to follow the detour sign and plunge into the dark woods. She turned onto the gravel road. It was wide and flat and covered with just a dusting of snow. There were no real street lights, of course, and the car's high beams couldn't seem to penetrate the woods past the first row of trees. Cheryl concentrated on the tire ruts that ran in front of her, and after driving for five or ten minutes, she realized there was something strange about this road. For one thing, the tire ruts she drove in were only on her side. Clearly, cars had headed down this road in her direction, but none had come back the other way. She'd almost decided to turn around and head back to the highway, when suddenly the bottom dropped out. Cheryl's stomach leapt into her throat as she felt falling, and then she was jolted by a bone-rattling crunch as the car slammed into the side of a hill, sloping downward. The road had ended suddenly, and Cheryl went over the edge at full speed. The car slipped and slid down the embankment and finally came to rest, sliding along the bottom of what appeared to be a massive gully. Cheryl panted hard, her heartbeat drumming in her ears. Her foot cramped where it was mashed against the brake pedal. She finally managed a breath, and the tears began to flow. After a few minutes, she calmed down and stepped out of the car to try and untangle her seized muscles. Immediately, her foot slipped out from under her and she barely caught herself on the car's roof. She scuffed some snow out of the way and revealed the smooth surface of hard ice beneath it. It was a lake. She was standing on frozen water. Looking around, she surmised she was at the bottom of a great pit. Probably one of those open pit mines around Eveleth or Virginia. After they play out, the pits fill with water and become lakes. Looking down, she could not tell how deep this one was could be six inches or six hundred feet. 
There was no way for her to tell in the darkness. And then Cheryl looked up and saw shapes all around her. Cars. There were other cars on the lake. There were trucks and vans and SUVs and commercial vehicles. And all of them were parked haphazardly as if they had simply slid to a stop as she had. There were hundreds of them. All dark. All quiet. And then Cheryl saw something that gave her a glimmer of hope. A police car was about 50 yards away. She slid and shuffled as best she could and managed to reach it without falling again. Its windows were completely covered with frost. She knocked on the driver's side. There was no response. She hesitated for a moment and carefully tried the door. It was unlocked. She opened it two, then three inches, just enough to see inside. She froze, terrified. There was a figure behind the wheel. It was black, completely black, like a hole in the fabric of space. It was in the shape of a person, but it wasn't a person. It was just the absence of light. Then the figure's head turned toward her and a wide gap opened where its mouth should be. And Cheryl saw row upon row of blindingly white teeth smiling at her, each one sharpened to a needle point. Cheryl ran. She fell several times getting back to her car, but she made it just the same. She slammed and locked the door and began to crank the engine. It stalled and choked, and then settled into the repetitive grinding noise that went on and on no matter how hard Cheryl pressed the key into the ignition. And then she saw them. From all around her, from out of every car, the black figures were emerging and beginning to walk toward her. And as they grew close, She saw figure after figure sporting a needle-sharp smile of needle-sharp teeth. Cheryl screamed for the last time. Several hours later, miles away at the county morgue, an attendant looked up from his phone as two paramedics pushed a stretcher containing a body bag into the room. What's this? he asked. Just found her on the road, one of the paramedics said. Car accident? No, nothing like that. Looks like she just pulled onto the shoulder and had a heart attack. Good thing she shot to get off the road. Traffic's pretty heavy tonight. Eh, probably a nervous traveler, the attendant said. He reached for the zipper that would undo the bag and found his hand stopped by one of the paramedics. Just prepare yourself, he said. There's no injuries, but her face. The attendant smirked. You didn't do this job without developing an immunity to some gruesome sights. He pulled down the zipper, pulled back the vinyl flaps, and gasped, stumbling backwards. Inside the bag lay Cheryl, her eyes still wide with terror, and her mouth was pulled back into a grimace of needle-sharp teeth. The Goalie. The town used to live for Friday nights and games at the arena. Even when the population fell, when graduating classes went from 300 to 100, there was always the constant of the hockey team and cold Friday nights when at least for a brief time people would gather and talk about old times, when trips to the state tournament in March were regular, even expected. But those times were in the past. Many people said that the Icebox Six was a ghost of the team they used to be. Six was a rather silly nickname. No one was quite sure of its origin, other than, of course, hockey as a game played six aside. Some years it seems like six was all the players they could field. Outnumbered three to one, the boys would do their best, but losses seemed inevitable. And then everything changed. Renoir came to town. Renoir was a goalie from Quebec, whose father had bought a piece of property down Old Old Farm Road. They were a quiet people who mostly kept to themselves. His father, a massive bear of a man, was only occasionally seen in town and spoke almost no English. He got by with grunts and hand gestures. Renoir's mother was surely not his real mother. She was a girl maybe ten years older than her son, and a wisp of a thing. Raven black hair, large, judging eyes, 
and the pale, translucent skin of a heroine from a Poe story. Other than driving Renoir to practice, she was not seen in town at all. But that didn't matter much to the town. The town forgave all once they saw Renoir play. Renoir was gifted between the pipes. He brought to mind famous Quebecer net miners like Martin Brodeur, Patrick Waugh, and even Jacques Plante. And as is the way of the game, Renoir's presence in the Icebox Six transformed them into winners. A hot goalie changes everything, and Renoir never seemed to cool down. Backstopped by him, the Six were beating schools they hadn't beaten in years. These boys, who had grown up with the weight of the past upon their shoulders, no longer needed to fear that a single mistake would result in disaster. Renoir could be counted on for 30, 40, sometimes 50 saves a game. Occasionally spectacular, but always rock solid, it was as if the sum knowledge of the position had been distilled into one 17-year-old boy. His English was poor, and despite his prowess on the ice, he was a loner at school, except for one teammate, a boy named Anderson. Anderson played left defense and was liked by everybody. He was not exactly popular, but in a school this small, everyone has a place. Anderson's place was the background of activity photos and the bench of most teams. Anderson and Renoir were attached at the hip. They took classes together, ate lunch together, and Renoir, who drove a beat-up Fiat his father had cobbled together from spare parts, drove Anderson to and from practice as they both lived along Old Farm Road. And, of course, they skated together. January became February, and the old-timers began to raise their hopes that this team this version of the Icebox Six would break through and qualify for the state tournament for the first time in 50 years. With Renoir, all seemed possible. Renoir, because of the language barrier, said very little about this. He said very little in school, or to the old-timers who tried to shake his hand, or to the legions of girls who tried to get his attention. Even to Anderson, his only real confidant, he said very little. But you could tell he understood the importance of what was happening. Here, in a small Minnesota town, Renoir felt the full weight of the community's hopes and dreams resting on his slim shoulders. A berth in the state tournament was so important it might as well have been the big leagues to these people. And as the season played out and the team kept winning, the pressure on Renoir increased. He began to grow thin and reedy. The circles under his eyes darkened from lack of sleep, and his dinner plate went untouched most nights. If his father noticed, he said nothing. And his father's wife had other things to worry about as she was with child and struggled with sickness and loneliness. She had no sympathy for her stepson, the hockey star. The regular season came to an end. The Icebox Six had earned themselves a right to host a game in the regional tournament, the competition just before state. They won that game and the next one besides. There was one final playoff for the prize the town most coveted. The game in the arena the fans, the bands, the pageantry, the state tournament. It was a taste the townspeople had not sampled in decades, and they were obsessed with tasting it again. The regional final was on a bitterly cold night. The week before had been a midwinter lie, a balmy stretch of days, some called Strawberry Spring. The sun came out, the thermometer touched 50, and the constant sound for a day and a, and a night was the dripping of melting snow. But all of this was a deception, a false promise, and when the temperature plummeted back to seasonal norms just before the game, more than one person around town thought it an omen, a lesson about false hope. But Friday night came, and the people, if they had a chance to come to the game, came in droves. Pickups and SUVs, all with full tanks of gas so their engines could be left running, filled the school parking lot. It was the largest crowd the old arena had seen in years. The Icebox Six stepped through the gate to thunderous cheers. The cheerleaders all looked their prettiest, their hair braided identically with ribbons in the team colors. They put hours of work into a figure skating routine they created especially for this game, and it went off without a single mistake. Then as the warm-ups finished, the lights in the arena dimmed. The ice seemed to glow softly, even magically. And as the skaters for each side lined up, the crowd held its collective breath. Something was wrong. You could hear the crowd's unease grow by the murmuring that circled the arena, for it was not Renoir in the net for the Icebox Six. It was his backup, a freshman who'd not played a single minute all season. He looked nervous and jittery. He needed help from two teammates scuffing up the ice in his crease. 
He hung his head as if he was going to be sick. As the puck was dropped, more people watched the bench than watched the game, looking to see if Renoir was present. And when he wasn't, they shifted their vigil to the locker room door, hoping to see it fly open and Renoir come charging out. But their hopes were in vain. Their star was missing. First there was a goal, then a stupid penalty, then another goal. The whole team looked out of sorts, hanging back timidly at the wrong moments, then charging in clumsily when they should have been patient. When the first period ended and the score was 2-0, everyone silently thanked the fates that it had not been worse. In the locker room, the coach rallied his troops as best he could, but it was an impossible task. The second period was spent in the icebox sixes end. By committing entirely to defense and harmlessly dumping the puck to the opposite end, the icebox six managed to give up only one goal in that period. The second intermission came, and the score was 3-0. The locker room was sullen and resigned. Already some of the boys were talking about what a good season it had been. No one blamed the freshman goalie who sat in one corner, a shell-shocked look on his face. Everyone, coaches and players alike, seemed resigned. The result of the game, a game with still a period to play, seemed preordained. It served an important purpose. It sent a message. Don't hope. Then everything changed. No one was really sure when he entered the locker room. No one had seen it happen. But as the intermission ticked down, everyone gradually fell silent. One by one, they looked into one corner, where there sat Renoir, putting on his gear. Had he always been here? Had he just entered? The coaches, who should have given him a tongue lashing for being late, said nothing. They would never admit it, but they chilled their bones just to look at the boy. He might have been a bit paler, but he always was very pale. He might have been a bit quieter, but he always was very quiet. The only thing about him that was strange is that as he got ready, he kept his goalie helmet on. For practical reasons, goalies put their helmets on second to last, just before the gloves, but Renoir had his on from the start. When the team stepped through the gate onto the ice to start the third period, a kind of low hum began to reverberate through the crowd, and then, as the reality of it sunk in, the cheers began, the deafening roar. Renoir glided over the fresh ice to his position. The chant shook the rafters of the old arena. Renoir, Renoir, they sang. The cheering did not stop for the first five minutes as the Icebox team won the opening face-off and did not give up the puck. They dug it out of the corners, slammed their overwhelmed opponents into the boards, flung shot after shot at the goal. First goal seemed inevitable because it was. At the stroke of five minutes, the Icebox six scored. 3-1. The slap in the face seemed to wake up the opponents who pushed back mightily, keeping the puck in the Icebox end for the next few minutes. They peppered Renoir shot after shot after shot, and he was up to the challenge each and every time. Though this was not the solid, fundamentally sound play the crowd was used to seeing, this was spectacular and somehow disturbing. Renoir twisted and turned, deflecting or catching puck after puck. He seemed to bend in ways a human being should not bend, but he stood up to the barrage, and after a fluke penalty, in the tenth minute, Icebox scored again to make the tally 3-2. Time ticked down. With two minutes left, the coach called Renoir to the bench for an extra attacker, he sat separate from everyone else, and they ignored him. A kind of collective superstition had settled on the team. They could not look at Renoir, or else the strange magic of the game would disappear. Then, up six skaters to five, the Icebox boys found an open man in front of the net. The shot was blocked. The rebound trickled toward a teammate on the open side. The goalie lunged. The puck zipped over his glove by an inch. 3-3. Three, three. Overtime. In the break before the extra period, Renoir sat silent in the locker room, a towel over his head, his hands completely lifeless in his lap. It was eerie the way he did not move. Usually Renoir was a normal goalie, jittery, nervous, his hands busy with a roll of tape, his knee bouncing up and down, but now he was still silent, and the team still refused to look at him. When it came time to return to the ice, Renoir was at the head of the line again. No one could remember seeing him stand up. No one could remember him brushing past them. He was just there, leading the team through the gate to the sound of hoarse screaming in the crowd. The overtime only lasted four minutes. The opponents were weary and overwhelmed by the level of emotion pouring down upon them from the stands, and they were unnerved by Renoir, the way he twisted and turned, the way he stood still and silent when the puck was at the other end. It was no wonder the opponents were goaded into a mistake, a penalty, a mischeck, a goal. 
Icebox had won. Delirium descended upon the arena. Icebox's bench emptied. Their sticks, helmets, and gloves littered the ice. The boys collected along the boards in one massive hug, and from the stands above, the sounds of joyful relief rolled down upon them like thunder. And when they turned to welcome Renoir into their embrace, they found him gone. Later that night, when Anderson and his father drove home from the game, they crested the small hill on Old Farm Road to see emergency lights flashing on the frozen sky. A state trooper flagged them down, then let them pass when they proved they lived along the road and warned them not to look. Car accident, he said. Bad. No survivors. The Anderson's truck slowed down, slow enough for the young defenseman, still wearing his regional championship medal, to see the twisted remains of what had once been a cobbled-together Fiat wrapped around a tree. His blood ran cold as he remembered the number of times he took silent rides in that car in Renoir's car. He could just see inside. The familiar slim figure was still in the driver's seat, his body twisted and crumpled into unnatural position as blood dripped down the door onto the gravel below. Back in the arena, the team's equipment manager cheerfully sorted through the gear that had been collected in their locker room, and among helmets and gloves, sweaters and tape balls, he found Renoir's complete kit, stick skates and all. And when the boy picked up one skate, his blood ran cold. It felt wrong. It was too heavy and cold like ice. And when he turned the boot upside down, foul and sour dirt poured out. The manager dropped the boot and ran from the room. Later he would claim the dirt smelled like a cemetery. They delayed Renoir's funeral so the Icebox Six could keep their date at the state tournament. Without him, they lost their first game 14 to two and came home to a very subdued celebration. In the weeks to come, the story would circulate that the car crash that killed the young goalie had happened 30 minutes before the game began. This was nonsense, of course, and cooler heads insisted that such rumors had to stop immediately. But the police records with the exact time of the accident mysteriously disappeared, and none of the boys on the team, even as they grew to men, would talk about that final fateful game. So naturally, the legend has only grown. From that day forward, every equipment manager, hockey player, figure skater, or coach knows not to be in the arena after midnight. That's Renoir's time, they say. And if you press your ear to the door, you'll hear someone skating in circles, around and around and around, forever. The Goalie is the name of that one. Ghost Stories from the Icebox Radio Theater was recorded before a live audience at the Salty Jester, a performance club in International Falls, Minnesota, on October 27, 2023. Our readers were Caleb Silvers, Ayla McIntosh, and Jeffrey Adams, who also wrote the stories we heard in this production. Partial funding for the Icebox Radio Theater provided by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. For more information on the Icebox Radio Theater, visit iceboxradio.org.